I think of as a recreation of Big Brother. Similarly, in Korea and Taiwan, people aren't necessarily leaving, uh, but they want more. They want a bigger share of the pie. Throughout East Asia, newfound affluence provokes impatience with paternalistic authority. Young people aren't interested in the obedient self-sacrifice that drove their parents. In South Korea, there is a widening gap between those who shop in Seoul's fancy boutiques and the general population that struggles to get by. Though cheap labor here won trade wars abroad, Korean workers didn't reap the benefits of the miracle. While they made sacrifices for national goals, they felt business leaders only helped themselves. When political reforms in 1987 lifted constraints on labor, the lid blew off. In just three years, 7,000 strikes rocked Korean industries, including a three-month walkout that paralyzed Chairman Yu's Pungsang Corporation. The strikes shocked business leaders, but some continue to cling to a Confucian family vision of the workplace. It seemed as if a disease was spreading throughout Korean companies. That disease, not a lack of company unity, that caused my workers to go on strike. In Taiwan, the lifting of martial law in 1987 created new stirrings for democracy. After 40 years of one-party rule, an opposition party was legalized. Last year, the old men who still represent districts on the mainland were forced to retire from the National Assembly. Along with the octogenarians, a sense of Confucian respect also seemed to disappear. <laughs> With political reform has come an awareness that Taiwanese have paid a high price for rapid growth that went unregulated by the government. Farmers' soil is saturated with leaching chemicals and heavy metals. Well water is tainted, sometimes flammable. The air is unfit to breathe for many weeks at a time. With few occupational safety laws on the books, workers are commonly exposed to toxic materials. Only 3% of Taiwan's 20 million people are served by sewer systems. The rivers are clogged with sewage and industrial waste. One 1989 study warned that if the government allowed development to continue unabated, Taiwan might be uninhabitable by the year 2000. In the rapid development of our economy, somehow we overlook the importance of social cost. And some of the industrial development has been accomplished without taking adequate care of the environmental uh, situation.
Many communities in Taiwan have decided to take matters into their own hands and stage protests against industries that contaminate their neighborhoods. That, that forced our government to learn some lesson. Every time from now on, if they want to set up a factory that will have pollution problem, they have to negotiate with the inhabitants of the community. They have to, to spend a lot of money and manpower for PR, uh, to consultation with the community leader. That's, uh, that's good for our democracy. Full democracy has yet to arrive in Taiwan, Singapore, or South Korea, but few want to keep the traditional social order. The Confucian ideology thrives on sacrifice. It, it thrives on people working together for an easily perceived common goal. To that end, they're, they're willing to make concessions, and they're willing to believe uh, in a government that is, if not virtuous, at least very, very efficient. But as government gets less obviously efficient, and as people get more affluent and have more of a voice, they're less of Confucian than they used to be. And this is changing. It's inevitably going to change. Confucius once said, the ruler is the wind, the people are the grass. When the wind blows, the grass is sure to bend. Today, in East Asia, the wind is changing direction. <laughs>